Okay. As uh, I'll start in Hebrew and then in English. Hi, everybody. אני נתי כהן, השותפה באקסלרטור של UpVenture ואנחנו היום בהרצאה עם ג'ונתן מילר, הוא יציג את עצמו ג'ונתן נמצא אצלי בקהילה של הפנטי ואני יודעת שהוא מתעסק בתחום מאוד מאוד חשוב ולכן אני שמחה מאוד לארח אותו כאן, אני אספר לכם Um, for Jonathan, hi Jonathan, we are in uh, Accelerator Adventure and we are happy uh, to invite you to speak and you can uh, um, explain a bit more about uh, the topic and introduce yourself. So Jonathan, the stage is yours. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. So today is not about me. Today is all about you guys and your business. And you know, I want to sort of go ahead and go through an exercise that's designed to go ahead and think about how you message. It doesn't matter if you're talking about messaging for yourself or messaging for your business. At the end of the day, everything is a big part of that message. And how you get your message across is very important. So we're going to go through a, a few different examples today. Um, but mainly, it's designed to be an exercise to help you guys sort of put things in perspective and to frame you for how I look at the world and maybe a different way for yourself to go ahead and examine how you interact with your audiences. So let me just pull up my uh, screen here. Okay, so can everybody see the screen? Yeah? Yes, Good? yes, yeah. Okay, see. great. So, The, the headline isn't designed to be this misleading, but it is designed to grab your attention a little bit. How to stand out in a world where everything's already been tried. Now, what exactly do I mean by this? You know, I, I used to have a former colleague years ago when I was in my 20s, and he used to tell me, because, you know, I used to catch him plagiarizing other people's work all the time, he used to come to me and say, Jonathan, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything's already been done. To which I said, that may be true, but it doesn't mean your work can't be original. Um, so, you know, even in a world where it's difficult to stand out and be original, there still are ways to do it. And one of the things that I want to go through today is how we can accomplish that as business people and what it means and what it looks like. But first, I want to start by asking you all a question. And in the chat window, you guys can go ahead and answer because I see everybody's on mute right now. What is business all about? Now, this sounds like the blue ocean of questions. It could mean a lot of different things. But... In my perspective, when I'm looking at approaching a business and when I'm meeting with a company, there's two things that really stand out to me. So if you guys want to take, let's say, 30 seconds to go ahead and put your responses into the chat, we'll go ahead and sort of review them and see exactly, you know, how it matters. And then I'll share a little bit about my perspective with you. Let's see how I put the chat here. All right, thank you, Aviel. <laughs> Get customers, make money. Very good answer. Um, but I'm going to take it one step further. You got the making money part right, but there's one part you missed, and that's the people. Okay. Now, a few golden rules of business for me. We aren't in business to make friends. I think that one probably is fairly obvious for everybody here. You know, It's great when you make relationships along the way. And in fact, a lot of our personal relationships come from the people we spend most of our time with outside the house. And that just happens to be in the workplace. But when we're talking about actually doing business, we're not necessarily in business to make friends. We're in business to make money. If we happen to make relationships along the way, even better. But business isn't only about money. It's also about those very relationships with your audience, with your customers, with your stakeholders. Relationships are very important because at the end of the day, People are the ones who make decisions. Now, I can reiterate that many different ways, but I think it's important to say AI, business intelligence, all of these technological solutions are great. They help us with insights. They help us gain perspective. But at the end of the day, humans are still behind the wheel. We're still the ones making the decision, no matter how many Teslas you've seen drive themselves. At the end of the day, we're not quite there yet. So business is all about the relationships you cultivate with other people. 
at the end of the day, if you're going to do business with a company, it's not just because you have the best product and service out there. It's generally speaking because they found something in you that they like, something in you that they can relate to, something that resonates. And business is still very much personal in that respect. Now, I'm not saying every business relationship needs to be a personal relationship, quite the contrary, but nevertheless, that you're appealing to people at the end of the day. So it's important that any pitch you have reflects that. So if business is all about people, how do you stand out from the crowd? Now, this is where it comes in for me. Motif content deals with messaging. We help companies craft their messages, how exactly they're going to go ahead and speak to their audience, how they're going to go ahead and reach and touch these people and give them a lasting impression. You know, first impressions are everything, but you've got to make that great effort to get to that first impression first. So you want to make sure that if you do get in front of that customer, it's unforgettable. So why the message matters so much? Well, you know it as well as I do. You guys probably spend at least around two or three hours on your phone every day. You're bombarded with advertisements, whether you're surfing the net or just in your daily life. And you know as well as I do that people's attention spans is just getting narrower and narrower and narrower as time passes. So you have a very, very limited window to go ahead and really grab their attention. Now, I'm not saying that you need to take this to a clickbait level. We've all been there before. We've all seen it. It's annoying, it's misleading, and it doesn't really give you a good taste once you've gone ahead and gotten through the link itself. So it's important to remember that you have a few seconds to persuade somebody, you need to give them something meaningful. You need to find a way to add value and a way to go ahead and stick in their minds thereafter. Because no matter what, at this stage, you are the setting the frame for all future communication, okay? So, we're going to take a look in practice. And this is the only sample I'll give you of my work because I don't think it's really relevant to go ahead and position myself here. I think, again, this is all about a thought exercise for you guys and how you guys can apply similar methodologies to your own enterprises, to your own communications. Now, in practice, what we do with clients is the same thing. Generally speaking, we sit down with them. We try and understand what their business is. We ask them a lot of questions. Generally speaking, nine times out of 10, they have the words. And they give us exactly what we need to go ahead and craft a message. Uh, but oftentimes, it's just about arriving at that point that's difficult. Now, the case study I have in front of you is a company called Koalas, based here in Israel. Uh, some very, very famous entrepreneurs here, French entrepreneurs, who came here and built an audiology, audiometry, basically technology that's mobile. Uh, I, I imagine that everybody here had a hearing test at one point in their life. And you know, in your younger years, probably at school, you probably remember these big, giant, bulky headphones, this big box that everybody traveled around with. And for the most part, it hasn't changed in about 60 years. Same technology, same principle, same test, nothing new. So these guys came in and they changed the entire game. They put everything on a tablet. They put everything on mobile devices. They digitized the entire process. And they were able to go even deeper than any audiometry and audiology technology before it. So obviously they had a lot of unique selling points here, but the issue was their name, Koalas. What does Koalas say about sound or hearing or anything else? Absolutely nothing. It's very hard to go ahead from Koalas to understand this is about hearing. So for us, it was trying to distill everything they did down into five words or less. In this case, we managed to do it in two. Now, a lot of med tech it's hard. It's hard to position med tech because one of the things that happens a lot in medical technology and the, pharma, the pharmacological fields and everything like that is everything looks like a doctor's office. And a lot of people are afraid of the doctor's office. A lot of people don't like that feeling. They don't like the beige. They don't like the approach. Nobody wants to go to the doctor. So for them in Koalas, it was about changing that. It was trying to go ahead and put the emphasis on why hearing is so great, why hearing is so wonderful, and why it's so important to all of the experiences around us. So again, to bring it back to hearing and how it's such a visceral element. And so we came up with the slogan, fundamentally sound. Now this worked for two different reasons. Number one, it talked about what they do. It's all about sound, it's all about hearing. And fundamentally sound can actually read two ways in English. I know it's gonna be a little difficult for the native Hebrew speakers here, but fundamentally in this case means it's at its core sound, it works well. And then on the other high side, it's also fundamentally about sound and about your hearing. So it's one of those ways we were able to capture what 
the name of the company could not, and go ahead and express to people right off the bat what this product was all about. But again, you really have a very short and small window, especially in the digital age, to capture people's attention. So your slogan, your tagline, what you say and how you do it, your elevator pitch, it has to be as meaningful and as compact a space as possible. So let's move forward. A few notes on persuasion. And like I said, and I promise here, just a few. Because persuasion goes hand in hand with branding. It goes hand in hand with messaging. There are a lot of persuasion tools out there, but there are a lot of good ones and there are a lot of bad ones. So I wanna go ahead and share with you a few of the good ones and a few of the bad ones. Now, it seems simple to say, but simplicity is always your friend when it comes to persuasion. Again, it goes back to people's attention spans. If you don't have a lot of runway with people's attention spans, you need to keep your message as distilled to its base level as possible. You know, complex is more complicated to understand. Simple is memorable. So these are, are something always to think about when you're messaging. You know, it doesn't even matter if you're sending an email. Nobody's reading a book in an email. They're gonna read a few bullet points and a few sentences. They're gonna skim through the rest. So unless you're gonna be meaningful and purposeful in a short space, you're probably gonna lose people. This one is big, repetition. And I can't stress this enough. It's all about repetition. Repetition is stickiness at the end of the day. The more you repeat yourself, the more you repeat the same message, the more you stick in people's brains. It doesn't matter good or bad. You know, I can show you the last four years of politics in America to stress exactly this point. It's always about repetition of very simple, strong messaging. And the last one here is visual words, okay? Think about any salesperson. Any salesperson is going ahead and trying to go ahead and plant in your mind an image of how you're gonna go ahead and use a product or service, how this is gonna make your life better. And they use a lot of visual imagery to do it. Sometimes they'll say, this will brighten up your life. This will go ahead and darken all of your competition. You know, there's many different ways that we can use these strong visual words to go ahead and make a very strong and meaningful persuasive impact. Not only that, but you know, when you're talking with somebody, especially in a sales role, you wanna sell past the close. You wanna think, okay, it's not just about what you're gaining today, it's about the added value this product or service is gonna bring you in the future and why you should keep coming back to it. So again, you're, you're trying to be relatable. And when you give those visual words, it really can inspire a good impression within people. Now, I have, oh. I have a question about the second one, the repetition. Uh, it sounds to me that it is double meaning. Repetition to the audience and repetition before in order to prepare yourself to be fluent more on the stage which one of them do you say well i think in general they're both persuasion elements you know i i would say in either one of the scenarios you just outlined your goal is to persuade it doesn't matter if i'm sitting up here speaking in front of an audience or you're speaking to a client or we're talking about your marketing materials repetition works it's been shown to work. One of the most interesting things about persuasion tools, and not many people know this, is even when the tactics are being used on people, and I know it, you know it, it still actually works. It does, you know, that, that's one of the, the beauties of persuasion is we all know the tips, we all know the tricks, but at the end of the day, it doesn't ever reduce its efficacy, which is very fascinating when you actually study how persuasion works and why it's effective. And repetition, again, it, it doesn't matter if you're repeating your speech in the mirror it doesn't matter if you're repeating on your brochure what you do, it's gonna be effective either way. It's gonna help ingrain and implant that seed. Is that going to be boring to the, to the people who listen to you that you repeat and you use the systematic uh, resolution over and over to other people? Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a good example to this point. Whenever somebody lectures or presents for the most part, what do they do? At the beginning, they introduce a little bit about what they're going to talk about. And at the end, what do they do? They summarize everything they've talked about. Why? Because they want to stick in your brain at the end of the time. It's not that you're going to remember every single word I said during this presentation. But at the end of the presentation, I hope that you're going to take away a few things by outlining the key points for you, what we went over and what we discussed. But there is such thing as too much. And that's where we get into sort of our weaker persuasion tools here. Ask 
a couple of questions on the previous slide, on this slide, on the previous slide. Please. Okay, two questions. First of all, visual words. Um, you said you can use positive visual words or negative. You mean to create a negative thing? Is there advantage? Um, it seems like I, I saw from reading that there's more an advantage of using positive than than the negative. Is it? What do you think? Well, from my personal perspective and from my very limited and narrow worldview, what I can tell you is that negative persuasion is around you pretty much all the time and you are very cognizant of it, even if you want to ignore it. What is the biggest negative persuasion technique? Fear. Okay. Fear. We can get a lot of people to do a lot of things with fear. Look at the last year and how a lot of fear was instilled in us, not necessarily for the right reasons, um, but to go ahead and get us to comply with certain things. Now, I, I don't like to always go ahead and, and quote this individual, but um, for anybody who saw Wild Wild Country, it was a story about basically a cult and a cult leader that went from India, from Pune, India to America. One of the interesting things that he said in some of his speakings and teachings is, you know, pandemics will happen for you know, the entirety of mankind in existence. They've happened in the past, they're gonna happen in the future. But more dangerous and damaging than the pandemic itself is the fear. The fear is what kills more people than anything else. And it's the same thing here. Fear is a very powerful force of persuasion. You know, and our politicians use it against us all the time and it works, it absolutely works, it's proven. And that's why they continue to use it. Now, would you rather be persuaded by something that's happy and nice and makes you feel good? Absolutely. But is fear a more powerful motivator? Unfortunately, yes. Well, may I say that in my view, uh, the fear is the first step to the uh, uh, powerful thinking that you can say my business diffuses your fear, overcomes over the problem. Sure, but you know, when you're when you're thinking about things like that, you know, you don't want to focus on the fear because you want to focus on the positive here. You know, think about it like this. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. FUD. It's a very great motivator. There's no doubt about it. But just like I said here, it's not everything I'm going to talk about that you're doing wrong. I don't want to say everything that you're doing wrong because it doesn't make you like me. If I say you're doing X wrong, you're doing Y wrong, you're doing Z wrong, suddenly there's a disconnect between us. Why? Because I found what makes us different. I found things that divide us instead of things that bring us together. And if I were in your shoes and your position, what would I do? I would say, okay, you know, this is where it stands right now. It's just like when I talk to a client, I already know what problem the client has. I don't need to repeat it to them for them to already know it. They know what their problem is. That's why they're coming to me. What I can do is show them how I can take what they have and make it better. How I can go ahead and build them something better because that's what they're looking for. All clients that come to us look for a solution. They're not looking for somebody else to restate the problem for them. So even if they're fearful of what a problem can cause, it's not always about playing on that fear. It's showing how you can add value and resolve their problem without actually having to discuss the problem. Does that make sense? Great. So moving sure. on to the week. Oh, go ahead. Sure. It makes, it makes sound. Thank you. Listen, there's no perfect world out here. I'm just sharing one perspective with you. And I'd like to highlight that repeatedly. You know, I'm trying to frame your mindset in a way that, you know, is kind of a little bit more agnostic towards the world and how the world works. It's not necessarily to say that the world works this way every single time. There's almost 9 billion variations of us. So we all don't work the same in any world. But at the same time, we're all watching two videos. You know, I'm watching my own video of the world and you're watching your own. We may be in the same space at the same time, but we can see two very different things. And so it's about recognizing that influence and you know, finding a good way to overcome it. And again, that's where persuasion comes in. I'm persuading you to see a different viewpoint that you, know, you may not have acknowledged, you may not have realized and trying to, to get you to, again, come to a different conclusion because of it. So the weak persuasion tools. Now, we went in before to the idea of listing at the end of a presentation what you talked about. So again, you can have that repetition to remind people. But one thing that doesn't work well is laundry lists, okay? Now, if I'm trying to sell you a product and I have a list of 30 reasons why you should buy it, do I really believe that you're gonna remember all 30 reasons by the end of our conversation? It's not reasonable. I'm gonna be lucky if you're gonna remember two or three. But if I ask you to repeat the list of 30 back to me, no chance. 
None whatsoever. And this is why laundry lists are often a bad form of persuasion, okay? If you really wanna make a list effective, and lists can be effective, there's no doubt about it, keep it to five points or less. It's the same thing when you look at presentations. You know, one of the golden rules for presentations, especially PowerPoint, is no more than eight lines and no more than eight words per line. Why? People can't remember more than that. And if you put all the information up there, people are just gonna read the presentation instead of listening to you. So there are certain little tricks and tips that you can do. It's just like occasionally planting a false mistake in something, okay? People will pick up on the mistake, but you've used that against them effectively. You've gone ahead and said, okay, I made a spelling mistake, but people picked up on that mistake and because of it, they paid more attention. So there, there's ways to, you know, also win people over with negative persuasion, even if they realize something is wrong because they do have that recognition. Analogies. Now analogies. Good question. Yeah. Um, regarding the laundry lists, if you do want the customer to know that you have 25 more um, reasons, so how do you um, relate that to them without overwhelming them? Overwhelming them? If your product is that good, you shouldn't have to give 25 reasons. I'm saying, let's say there's 30, you, let's should, there's... you should be able to distill it down into the best five reasons for doing something. And if they're are looking for reasons, not features, features are not reasons. Like, let's say you have a, uh, a program that's, that has 30 features. It depends because you can, you can frame it differently for every client. Every client has a different set of problems. And if you understand what their problem is, you can find the five features that resolve that problem instead of having to give them the laundry list of 30. But that's about knowing your client, knowing your audience and knowing what you're walking into. And how do you do that? It goes back to the beginning by having that relationship and understanding that business is built on relationships and people. If you can appeal to the people, you can understand what their problems are. Once you understand what their problems are, you can give them all the information they need to make the decision you want them to make. But throwing the list of 30 features at them may not be the way to do it when you're in casual conversation or even over an email, okay? It's something where you wanna hit the biggest pain points first and you can leave the rest of them to later. Excuse me uh, for uh, intrusion. At the end, please don't talk and move because it makes lots of uh, uh, noises. Okay, please sit. Sit. Noises, audio, audible noises, or just yeah. audio, audio. Yeah, it is very hard to understand you. Okay, so when I'm on mute, you uh, you let me uh, rock back and forth. Okay. <laughs> much as you like. Okay, the last one, and this is an important one because generally speaking, a lot of us are very technical people, okay? And we have a lot of technical work ahead of us, but not everybody understands the technical jargon. And I can sound very smart by using words like, I want to leverage and capitalize your business with the most efficient structured product ever. And I'm saying absolutely nothing. I'm just using word salad to confuse you. You don't want to confuse your audience. You always want to be as straightforward and easy to comprehend as possible. You know, I, I, I hate to go back to uh, Donald Trump because I know he's a very decisive figure, divisive figure, excuse me. But one of the things you'll notice that he does in his rhetoric is he keeps his language very simple. He has very simple messages. People often say, well, he speaks at a fourth grade level. Yes, and there's a very good reason for it. It's because people remember that. People don't remember all the foreign policy jargon. People don't remember all of the military jargon and everything else, or all the political, well, we have this process and this person that, no, they want simple and easy to digest things like build a wall. It works very well with people, especially when you build and repeat it a hundred times. Now, I'm not saying he's somebody we should look up to as far as persuasion, quite the, quite the contrary, but I'm just using it as a good example here. Try and keep things as simple as possible. It all boils down to simplicity at the end of the day, even when you're crafting your best messaging, it's not about having the most, uh, let's say, in-depth explanation for doing something. Sometimes that in-depth explanation is great, especially when you're dealing with a counterparty who's just as technical as you and needs those kind of feedback and resources. But generally speaking, in most audiences that you'll talk to, word salad and saying absolutely nothing with the most complicated words around is not the best way to persuade. In fact, it may give people the idea that you're confident, that you know what you're talking about, but if everything you get across is meaningless to them, you failed. So where messaging and persuasion meet, because this is why we're here today, is trying to go ahead and combine the two is the most effective thing possible. Now, 
here is a very famous work of art. And a lot of it is political in nature that we're gonna share for the next few minutes. It, it's commentary on, on both society and, and politics. But here was one that was done a few years ago and commented about the idea of refugees. You know, if there were no refugees, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of great things. Steve Jobs' family was Syrian refugees. If they were not able to go to some place from Syria, we would never have had Apple, we would have never had Mac. All of these things would never have come to fruition. Now, why am I gonna go ahead and, and share this example right here? Because I think in a lot of ways, art is a very, very compelling way of getting messages and points across. Now, it's not always the case. Some of it is for entertainment, some of it is for gratification, some of it is absolutely meaningless. But there are times when the visuals really complement the language that you're using to describe something. And that is where I see a very compelling intersection. And we'll show a good examples. As I said before, everything under the sun has already been done. So some of our best audio artists of the 21st century are actually doing a great job of showing us how persuasion can be done in a very visual and provocative way that gets us to think, it gets us to remember, it gets us to engage. Because no matter what, all persuasion is designed to do the same thing. It's to get somebody to engage. Banksy. Now, I don't know if everybody here is familiar with Banksy, but Banksy is an anonymous British street artist. He's a graffiti artist who's very well known for having a lot of very interesting commentary on society, politics, people, a lot of different things. But even though he's not selling anything, he doesn't even sell his work. He just posts it for free everywhere and people sell it, you know, for their own gratification. You know, he's probably one of the most brilliant marketeers in the last 20 years. And why? Because he's able to go ahead and engage the mind. And that's the key here for any message. You're trying to engage the mind. He makes people think. So a look at this, this image, you know, it's a little bit provocative, yes, but, you know, it adds light to society. It shows the other side. You know, we always like to think of all the things bright, shiny, and nice, and polished and clean, but the truth of the matter is, is society is very unvarnished. There's a lot of imperfection in it. And, and this is just one of those prescient examples here. But we're adding color, and messaging is all about adding color. Now, business is not just, as you see here, uh, about providing a service. You know, at the end of the day, you're, you're really trying, when you're talking about persuasion, and when you're talking about messaging, you're trying to provoke an emotion, a thought, a perspective that invokes an action. And I'm not saying you always need to be provocative or the most edgy to do it. You know, this is just one example of one of the edgiest artists in the universe, but that doesn't mean he's always the most effective communicator. It's just an example of saying, well, okay, let's look at this image right here. You know, a caveman with uh, fast food, you know, talking about where we started versus our convenience culture now and looking at it as a setback, not a, not a step forward. You know, it's a very interesting juxtaposition. It makes you think, you know, how, how, could, how could the planet look different? How could society look different? Now, as I said before, you know, it's important not to take too aggressive an approach. You know, you can turn people off as well. And there is such thing as too much. You know, I think living here, a lot of us have been bombarded with some of that aggressiveness once or twice before and found it very off-putting and turning off and like, no, no, thank you. I don't want this. So that's why I say it's important here to be thought-provoking without straying too much in the realm of provocative. Now, this picture is perfect example of that. But free speech with conditions that apply, okay? Everybody thinks this free speech is free, but is it truly free? You know, it's a very thought provoking comment. And a lot of people say, well, free speech is okay until a point, but there is a point at which we need to regulate speech. So is free speech really free? You know, and it, you can get people to start a conversation, get a discussion. And that's the way we can use these rhetorical tools. That's the way we can use persuasion and messaging, to open a conversation. From there, it's up to you to go ahead and persuade, to expound, to explain, to describe, but it's a great opener. You've already caught their attention. Now you have a great way to start a conversation. Again, if business is about people, you have to relate to the people. If you can find a way to start a conversation, even if you don't always disagree, agree with all the viewpoints shared, you know, it's still about finding that common ground in business, not about what makes you different, not about what separates and divides you, but what brings you together at the end of the day. So 
tying everything together. So here are some actionable steps. And like I said, this is more of an exercise. I'm not here to talk about what I do or why I do it or how I do it. This is about trying to examine your own business, your own entrepreneurship, your own initiatives, and, and how you can use some of these tools to go ahead and add value to those initiatives. So first things first, if you haven't already done this for your business, this is the starting point where I walk every single client through. It starts with having a mission, a vision, the values that underpin your company and understanding who your audience is. You know, if I'm selling ice cream, am I gonna go ahead and start selling to Eskimos or, you know, people to Chicago, in Chicago in the middle of winter? No, I, I'm, that's not my audience. You know, selling ice cream to people who are cold is probably not the way that I'm gonna go ahead and be effective. So I need to recognize that who's my audience for ice cream? People at the beach at summer. They want something to cool off. They want something refreshing. They want something sweet. This is where I need to position myself, not in the middle of the North Pole in winter. Now, values are also important because values are relatable at the end of the day. And values inform how you approach people. You know, if I'm in investment banking, am I gonna go ahead and stroll in casually with shorts, t-shirts, and the sandals like I am right now? No, absolutely not. It's gonna send the wrong message. Why? Because they're looking for somebody who's polished, who's professional, who's wearing the suit, the tie, has their shoes polished. That's important to them. Image is important for that audience, but not for every audience. If I'm going to talk about digital out-of-home advertising, for instance, in the advertising, in the ad tech industry, you would never go into a business meeting with a suit and a tie. People would laugh you out of the room. You need to show that you're comfortable, that you're a little bit more casual, that you're creative, that you're not stiff. You don't have the stiff starch collar. That's, that's not the industry. That's not the business. So understanding who you're talking to is just as important as the message that you eventually deliver. Because again, that message is going to be tailored for that audience. Can I ask a quick question? Please. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm stuck in the forest. I can't, I can't see, I, I'm stuck. I see so much. I can't see a bit the big picture and it's hard for me to, um, to pick the, the best company mission, organization, vision, values. The audience is may, maybe a little different. It's more of like a technical analysis, but um, the other three are like more value um, driven. Um, are there any tools that uh, help people to think outside the box, to see examples, to try to relate to things? Listen, I, I, think, I think, you know, it's important to, to understand what the mission and vision statement are, are, are saying, really. You know, it's not just the mission is about what we're doing right now, how we're helping people right now. The vision is how we're going to continue helping people in the future. And again, these statements don't have to be, you know, laundry lists and pages long. It should be something really simple. You should be able to really try and encapsulate what you do in one or two sentences. That's effective, that's meaningful. Because again, people aren't gonna read through paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. That's not interesting to them, but they want something that they can relate to. So, you know, if you don't mind me asking, when you talk about technical analysis, can you be a little bit more specific about the industry? Um, sure, I mean, in my case, it's a, um... It's schools, it's private schools, uh, mostly small schools. But my question was really coming from, let's say you just created a car. It's efficient, it has amazing safety, it's cheap. So like, what do you focus on? You focus like Ford that says affordable Simple. cars, you focus on? Simple, the company mission is to get you from point A to point B in the most safe and efficient way possible. Efficient, safe and efficient. Safe and efficient, mm -hmm. okay. Now, that's just one example. I'm, I'm just spouting off the top of my head right now. It's not, you know, it's not that this has to be the only way. There's many ways to do it. But I could say, now that I have my vision to get you from point A to point B as quickly as humanly possible in the safest fashion possible, if I'm looking at the vision, I want to go ahead and build a vehicle that caters to your every need and that is going to go ahead and show for you across the planet one day. Instead of just having to go to the store, I can take you to a far away land that you've always wanted to visit and see. That's my vision for how my auto is going to be better for you. Because it shows people, it's, it's, it's the same idea as selling past the close almost when we're talking about a vision statement, okay? People want, it, why, do, why do people like Elon Musk, okay? Personally, I don't like him. I think he's a huckster. But what? that doesn't mean he's not effective. Who's this? Okay, Elon Musk of Tesla. 
He's a very outspoken personality and things like that. Now, why do people like him? Why do people revere him? It's because not only has he been articulating his vision to people and showing them, wow, I want to get us to Mars. There's going to be a lot of people who die along the way, but we're going to get to Mars one day and we're going to build a colony of humans out there. You know, again, it's that very visual imagery, like we are going to Mars and we're going to build a community. Okay, that's a very compelling statement, irrespective of the logistics and all the work that's involved with getting to point A to point B. But again, it gives people an idea of where things can go. It's, it's leading them and, and sort of helping them navigate what the future can look like. And that's why it's useful. That's why it's valued. Now, I'm not saying that he is the smartest person in the world, quite the contrary. I, I don't view him in that light, but he does know how to appeal to people's sensibilities and how to appeal to people's interests. And that's the point I would take away from this right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. But are there any tools that you, um, I mean, besides like hiring a business consultant or marketing consultant? I think these are fundamental things that everybody should establish before they get into business. I don't think that, you know, of, of course, I think every, every business person has the, the same constraints. When am I going to find the time to do this? How am I going to make the time to do this? I've got so many other things to do. I've got to focus on, you know, building the product. I have to focus on marketing. I have to focus on sales, managing the team doing all the administrative work, when am I going to find, but no, these, answering these questions is very important because it's informing you about why you're getting into business, what you're doing here and why what you have to convey is valuable. Okay. Because without all this, why should anybody believe that what you have to offer is valuable? You're, you're not, you're not engaging in those sort of appeals that they want to see at the end of the day. They want to have a partner for what they're trying to embark upon the adventure, the journey. And so at the end of the day, you, you want to make them feel like they are a part of that, that what you're saying resonates with them, that what you're doing makes them happy or makes them excited. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, may I ask about uh, the mission and vision? What do you, what are the main characters which differentiate between company mission and organization on vision? Okay, great question. I'm glad you asked. So I kind of touched on it before, but I'll go a little bit deeper now, okay? Mission. Mission is what we're doing right now. We set out to go ahead and transform the world with our technology. And we're offering this technology to go ahead and solve all of your problems. Okay, that's our mission. We want to come solve all of your problems with our technology. Now, the organizational vision is not just about what we're doing right now, but where we see ourselves in the future. Think about it like a five-year plan almost, okay? The mission is what you're accomplishing today. The vision is where you see yourself in the future. Does that provide more of a little uh, difference between the two that's meaningful? Yeah, yeah. It is reasonable. Thank you. So now on to step two, simplify. Like I said before, you know, this is an exercise that everybody can participate in. Just like I showed you the example before, fundamentally sound. You know, every business should be able to really try and condense what it does into two to five words. I'm not saying you need to name your industry. If I'm Goldman Sachs, I don't need to say financial services. I, I need to say something like building the future or something like, you know, there, there's many different ways I can boil down what I'm doing, you know, investing in the future or something like that, you know, but I don't want to go to 20 or 30 or 100 words because nobody's going to remember that. At the end of the day, it's got to be something simple. It's got to be something sharp, pointed. that's going to stick with people. You know, again, whenever you're putting your brand in front of somebody, you're, you're trying to maximize the impact and the recognition. It's just like if you look at this presentation in the top left corner of almost every slide, you'll see my company's branding. Now, it's there intentionally. Why? Because I'm hoping that once you leave this presentation, in the future when you think, wow, I need some help crafting a message. Who is that guy who presented to us a while back? You know, something with an M, motif or something. But it's there. It's there to repeat, to keep getting in front of you. It's the same reason why companies advertise on TV and have their logo prominently. Again, they're, 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 they're trying to make an impression and stick there forever. They're not trying to leave your imagination. You know, Coke is always trying to go ahead and put their Coca-Cola brand everywhere because they don't want you to buy Pepsi. 
They want you to think about the exhilarating experience you had when you were at the ballpark or, you know, when you were with your family on a picnic and saying, wow, what a great time. You know, they, they always want to be and have a strong reminder of where they were. So that's why I say simplify. All of you can go ahead and describe your businesses in 100 words or more, but the talent is distilling and boiling it down into something that's very simple, very straightforward, and very memorable. And I think if you go through the world's major brands, you can find the exact same principles. Nobody has a 10, 20, 30 word slogan. They all have two, three, four, five words, no more. Because again, they need to make it memorable and they have a short window to make an impression. Now the last one, be relatable. Now this is one of the hardest things. It's easier said than done. And I will be the first one to tell you that being relatable is quite a climb up the mountain, okay? Again, not everybody relates to the same thing. And that's why it's so important to really engage in your previous steps to establish who your audience is. Because once you understand what your audience is, it's easier to understand their likes and dislikes, where you should focus your attention versus where you shouldn't, okay? If I am, again, if, if I'm going to the, the marketeer, am I gonna talk about spending a weekend playing golf or, you know, the, the weekdays on my yacht? Probably not, no. I wanna talk about more about the most recent art exhibit at the Tel Aviv Art Museum or the Modern Museum of Art or one of these interesting uh, new artists is selling their digital art these days. Again, it, it's something to, I, I know this person is gonna be a little bit more creative and I wanna go ahead and appeal to that sense of creativity by engaging with that creativity. If I'm gonna to go to an actuary, am I gonna start talking about art? Probably not. I'm probably gonna get more into the numbers and what the numbers are telling me and the latest business intelligence software that's gonna help me make better decisions for you know, whatever I'm going ahead and doing the math for. So again, that's why it's so important to go ahead and establish what your audience is in that first step. Because again, that mission, vision, values, audience, all these four components really sort of give us a clearer idea of who we're talking to, why we're talking to them and what we should be saying, okay? And again, you know, it's all about finding that emotional appeal. If you talk to any salesperson, they'll tell you the same thing. It's not necessarily that they have the best product or service, but they manage to get the best appeal to a person. You know, used car salesmen don't have the best products, do they? They don't have something new. They don't have something shiny all the time, but they're effective and they're successful. Why? Because they understand that the person buying a car is not a machine. It's not a computer. It's somebody with feelings. It's somebody who has very real problems. And by appealing to those sensibilities, they're able to sell cars, no matter you know, how rough it may look or how many miles it may have on it. It's not about that. People buy from people who they like. You know, I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other night when I was out, and he was telling me about his sales team in the United States, and they sell cosmetics. Ulta is one of the biggest cosmetic stores in the United States. And basically, he was representing a company's product. And he saw that the product wasn't selling. So he brought in his own sales team to do the selling. Now, Ulta looked at him and saw the way he was selling. He was like, how are you so effective? Why does this work so well? And he's like, I don't bring in models to sell. My salespeople aren't the best looking. They're not the most attractive. They're, they're not the people you know, who we wanna promote here because we're talking to actual people and people want something real. The fake, blonde, you know, is not going to be the one who sells more than the ordinary person, you know, maybe a little rough around the edges, a little upkept hair, maybe a little bit overweight, because these are real people. At the end of the day, you're selling real products to real people. So you need to have real people selling them who believe in it and who aren't just modeling there and, and you know, hard to identify with. The people who are going to Ulta and everywhere else are trying to make themselves look and feel more beautiful. They, they want that sensation. They're going there because something about themselves they may not like, or they want to change, or they want to reshape. And they go to that store to find them, but they also want to relate to similar people. It's not that they suddenly want to go ahead and be told by somebody who looks all the things that they want to be, what they should do, if that makes sense. So that's why he's so effective at selling. It's not that his salespeople are, are any more or any less effective. It's because they're that much more relatable. So again, it's, it's all about getting personal. You know, I, I hear especially, you know, business is personal. 
people want to do business with people they like, with people who have the same values, with people who espouse the same ideas, with people who share the same ideals. You know, that's, that's just a part of doing business here. In the rest of the world, is that the truth? Not really. Business isn't quite so personal in the rest of the world. But that doesn't mean that it's any less focused on relationships. And it doesn't mean that you, you don't have to have that same sort of personal appeal and magic and charm. It's quite the same. But again, it's just in a different frame. So some key takeaways for today. Messaging is hard. You know, it, it's a real struggle to, to be out there and be unique. You know, how, if you're an accountant, do you find a unique angle to go ahead and appeal to people? Well, I can give you a few examples. There are accountants who are on Facebook and advertising every day to me, even though I have an accountant I love and hold true. Why do I love the accountant I have? Because he speaks my language. He knows exactly what I want, exactly when I want it. Now, why did I like this other account that I found on, on Facebook? Because she was out there. She was sitting, she was talking, she was being relatable. But one of the things I didn't like was looking at her office. She has a very fancy office. Everything is carefully curated and everything else. And those things don't appeal to me. I'm a very sensible, sensible and functional human being at the end of the day. When I walk into a client's office and I see a really fancy office, it means to me, well, they're not interested in investing in their human capital and talent. They're more interested in how they look than the business that they do. And that's why, you know, I didn't switch my account. But that doesn't mean that she didn't stand out and that she didn't have some stickiness because I still remember her. I'm talking to you about the, her now and I'm reiterating this thing because even though she didn't necessarily persuade me to switch accountants, she managed to stick in my head. And that's persuasion, that's good messaging. But that's why I say this is a process. And by starting with the basics and understanding who you are, what you wanna do, who we're talking to and where we wanna go with this, everything else can follow. It is a hard process, it does take time, but it is very doable. The key, of course, is that persuasion. That persuasion is a huge component of messaging. When you put them both together symbiotically, you can do wonderful and amazing things. So of course, above all, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And if you do wanna reach me, um, you're more than welcome to reach me by email and phone. Nati, I'm sure has all the details over here, but Avi, I can see you have a question, so shoot. Yeah, uh, we are at the very first stage of finding uh, colleagues and finding some uh, who can invest in our projects. Would you say that the same essentials that you have explained here persuade these colleagues and the potential investors as well as the uh, users and the companies? Well, I, think, I, I think you've you brought up a really good point here and I'd be happy to address it. Number one, in both demographics that you're talking about, whether it's investors or whether it's users, you still have to persuade them, okay? There's no, there's no difference in that respect. You still have to persuade them, but your message is gonna be different, absolutely. Okay, okay. Now I would like to hear what are the differences? Absolutely, okay. So when you're talking about users, what are users looking for? they're looking for something that's gonna add value to their process, okay? What is an investor looking for? They're looking for something that's gonna add value to their wallet, okay? They have a very different ambition. They want to get their money back and they want to work with the team that's gonna get them their money back as quickly as possible. It's not to say that the user is any different. The user wants to add as much value as quickly as possible, but the difference is, is you know, you're, you're, you're persuading people on two different things. An investor may not understand the technical side of your business to see that there's value there. I'll give you an example. You know, I'm not an engineer. I don't understand weight to thrust ratios, but I can tell you without a doubt that a plane is the quickest way for me to get from point A to point B. Now, because I'm not an engineer and because I don't understand the weight to thrust ratios, does that prevent me from getting on the plane? No, I just trust in the process. Um, and it's the same thing for investors a lot of times. Not every investor is super technical, but that doesn't mean that they're not under, uh, unable to understand value in a value proposition in the same way that you know, a user is able to understand the same value proposition. In fact, I would argue that you could take the value proposition to both parties and be effective. However, what you're gonna tell the investor is very different from what you're gonna tell the user. The investor is gonna wanna see how quickly I'm gonna get my money back the user is going to want to say, well, how quickly can I add incremental value from what you're offering, right? 
So the pitch is different. The message is different. The audience is different, even though the persuasion is almost identical. And the values are different. Well, I would argue that an investor doesn't always care about your values, but that's not always true either because investors are also humans and they want to like you. If an investor doesn't like you, but you have the best product in the world, you still may have very slim chances of winning them over. I wouldn't say that you have the best chances of winning somebody over if they don't like you. So again, it, it comes back to that relationship and that relatability. You know, people want to work with people they like. People don't want to work with people they hate. No matter how right that person is, no matter how smart that person is, if you're a despicable human being, nobody's going to want to work with you. How do you go about to find the companies or other, uh, other side uh, values? How do you find out what are their values? We have long conversations like this and we drill down. We try and understand what they're going to do. So in my specific case, we work with very, very, I would say, technologically oriented companies. Now, what is the problem that a lot of these companies face? Very simple. They're very technical, they're very smart, and they're very bad at dealing with people. Uh, why is that? Because a lot of the engineers who are behind a lot of these products are very good at explaining the technical specs, but they're very bad at relating to the people who are actually using the technology and using the product because their messaging isn't on point. Their messaging is, of course you would use this. It's the best out there, so why wouldn't you? But that's not persuasion. That's not persuasive in any manner. That's just saying we're the best. This is all an ego exercise. Whereas when I'm coming in, I'm going ahead and saying, okay, well, who is this directed at? What are they looking for? What's their problem? And how am I gonna show them that I have the thing that's gonna resolve their problem without telling them that they have a problem. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna add value and an engineer is trying to figure out why this is better than everything else. So it's a change of perspective. You know, again, we deal a lot with very technical projects. You know, I could start explaining to you all different sorts of things about AI and blockchain and all these latest and greatest technologies. But if you don't understand how it's gonna add value to your life, you're not impressed, you're not interested, you're not even gonna listen. You're just gonna ignore me because it's just not, it's not what you need. It doesn't speak to you. And so that's the thing is, is trying to translate and transform all the tech speak into something that's very relatable. To me, the smartest people in the world aren't the people who know the most. The smartest people in the world from my perspective are the people who can take any complicated idea and explain it to everybody because that is value. That is meaningful, that is relatable. That is, uh, Alex uh, Asimov's uh, motivation of writing science fiction. 100%. And I, I think the way that I would end this conversation is as follows. I, you know, I, I don't know if everybody here has read The Art of War, but one of my favorite quotes from The Art of War is as follows. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So why do I say this? is because no matter what, no matter what strategy you're embarking on, it has to come with the tactics. If your strategy overall is to persuade, you still need the tactics, like understanding what's my mission, vision, values, audience. One doesn't work without the other. You can't just have one and not have the other. The two, you know, don't work independently. They work together symbiotically. And so it's important to appreciate and respect that. It's great to line out the strategy. Over the next year, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z to go ahead and build uh, you know, a customer base of 100,000 users, okay? That's a great strategy, but what are the tactics I'm gonna to use to get there? How am I gonna engage people? How am I gonna make them aware of what I wanna do? It's great to have the goal here, but what I'm talking about is building the systems to get to that goal. Uh, I conclude that uh, to myself that there are three different persuasions that we need to do with the colleagues, with investors, and the end product buyers. Absolutely, absolutely. But, and, and that's why I say, it's not something you're not already used to. You do it every day, even without thinking about it. But who you do it for varies, how you do it for that audience varies, and how they interpret that meaning varies as well. So 
just like you said, you know, it's, it's part of your approach every single day. You have to talk to investors, you have to talk to users, you have to talk to your own team. You, all, you have to convince all of them that they're doing the right thing at the end of the day. Even if you know, they may not agree or they may not be on board, you need to find that power of persuasion in you to go ahead and get that. You know, it's like the difference between you know, a boss and a leader. You know, a boss is somebody who just expects everybody to carry them along with their work. A leader is somebody who's out in front and who's showing that they can do the work too, that they're not afraid of getting their hands dirty to go ahead and make this thing work. That is leadership. That is leadership by example. It's not, you know, taking credit for other people's work and saying, well, this is, this is mine. I did this all by myself. It's, it's not an ego exercise. Leadership is all about persuasion and showing people that, you know, you can, you can walk the walk as, all, as well. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to wrap up here because I think I even went over the, the time that I had uh, expected, but, uh, you know, of course, if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me personally. I'm happy to yeah, assist. I'll, I'll put your, um, I already gave uh, Adi, uh, snap here your phone number and then I'll add it to the WhatsApp group uh, that they will, can contact you. Right, we didn't get to meet Adi, but uh, you know, I'm happy to yes, meet in person. Uh, Our office is in Tel Aviv and uh, everybody's welcome for a coffee or a snack or whatever else uh, fits your fancy. I think we also have tea and fun stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice, nice meeting you, Jonathan. Yeah, Thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I wish everybody a great week ahead. Yeah, and hopefully a quiet weekend. Amen. successful persuader. Why? Yeah. <laughs> you persuade well, I mean, that. <laughs> I, I should I should hope so. This is my job. If I'm if I'm doing a bad job now, then I, you know, I should probably not be a storyteller for a profession. Happy to hear from you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Wonderful day. Thank you very much. Take care.